can do. So thank you so much to uh, to Robin for hitting the record button for us. Uh, the questions that we're going to cover today um, are things like, what do you see as the role of the arts in the climate crisis? What are some examples or strategies you have seen that have had an impact? Um, whose voices are heard? Whose perspectives are reflected? Whose are excluded? And what is needed now? So calls for action for artists and those in arts communities. So we'll start with the first one. Uh, what do you see as the role of the arts in the climate crisis? Um, and I'm wondering if anyone would like to, to go, otherwise I'll just call upon Laura. Sure, okay, no, okay, <laughs> happy to kick it off. Okay, well, from my perspective, um, the climate crisis is really driven by a cultural crisis. We're not in an emergency because we lack knowledge. We're not in an emergency because we lack the technological solutions. I think Greta Thunberg kind of reminds us of that as well. You know, she says, we've had uh, the science and we've had the means to address the problem for decades now. Um, we're not doing it. We haven't done it. We're not doing it fast enough. So for me, this is a cultural crisis and most of us here are in the cultural sector. So I think we do really have a, an important part to play uh, in, in addressing, addressing the problem. Um, and I think, you know, the role of the arts, I mean, I think we're also in this crisis because, you know, the, the cultural crisis that this has stemmed from is really a crisis of a belief that we are separated from the natural world, right? That we are better than it, more important than it, above it. Um, Val Plumwood, the philosopher, calls this hyper-separation. Um, and so I think art then is really useful, um, not for aestheticizing kind of data or educating us, but actually for showing us our entanglement with the non-human. Um, and I think a really beautiful example of this, uh, and um, there might be some some sort of websites to go with this. I'm not sure if um, some of the organisers will put those up, but um, is a, an Australian performance artist named Hannah Cormack, um, who I um, who works uh, out of Canberra, and who suffers um, a series of of very severe um, disabilities, uh, including um, such that she lives her life. Uh, locked in a kind of sealed room um, in, um, on her own and has to be very careful about going outside of that room. Um, and when she does, wears a full uh, face respirator mask and an oxygen tank and, um, and but decided, but began her life as a performer, as a circus performer, as a physical theatre performer, um, was highly skilled, worked all over Europe um, before she got sick and made a performance work um, in the 2020 Sydney Festival um, called The Mermaid, which you might want to have a look at. Um, and really this work was really about showing this kind of ways in which the human body is entangled um, with, with the non-human bodies or more than human bodies. And the way, because um, Hannah is very sick um, and, and this performance took place in an indoor space, in an old coal mining um, uh, storage space, uh, and also during the Black Summer, what was what happened was there was a it happened to coincide accidentally um, with the Black Summer bushfires in um, in Australia, um, the worst bushfires on record, the mega fires, uh, and so it was extremely polluted. She was performing in an indoor space; um, it wasn't safe for her to kind of perform in that indoor space telling a kind of narrative about her experience of disability um, and of being kind of sequestered away in, from the world. And through that, um, that kind of dialogue, she also was existing, kind of having real-time uh, seizures in front of the audience from um, the impact of what the audience was bringing into the, the theatre space. So smoke in the air, the polluted air, but also things like deodorants, perfumes, food in their bags and so forth. And so I think a work like that is incredibly kind of confronting, um, watching kind of these medical emergencies being played out on stage. And Hannah obviously risked a lot, a lot of out of personal safety in order to um, perform this work. But it was, I think, a really powerful example of the ways in which art can show us 
um, in horrifying and, and terrifying kinds of ways that that entanglement of, of the human with the non-human. Hopefully that's not too long an explanation. No, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Laura. And I think you hit upon something too where um, we have had the knowledge and the solutions. And I think sometimes, uh, you know, I do environmental programming. Sometimes we get into the trap of thinking if we just craft the message in the right way, if we just make it visually pleasing, uh, then people will take action. Or what is it that that drives people's behaviors and actions? And so is it that emotional connection? Is it um, changing worldviews and mindsets? But how, you know, it, it's a it's a complicated thing. Yeah, and performance does you know, it it speaks to people in, an, in a strongly embodied way. And a work like that is you cannot not feel it viscerally. Everyone who went to the, the, the performance space to see the show was already suffering kind of respiratory um, difficulties from, from the bushfire smoke. But then to see a kind of heightened version or a sort of futuristic, dystopian sort of futuristic um, version happening on another body live in front of you is incredibly kind of confronting um, and, and affecting, I think, in a way that that you kind of data, giving you kind of data evidence, just you can't communicate in that way. Thank you, Lara. Um, Kendra or Michael, do you have any uh, examples or things that you want to build off of? <laughs> Uh, I would just say um, that uh, sometimes the role I think of the artist is to raise awareness, but I think kind of as what, <laughs> similar to what Laura was saying, like there's no more need to raise awareness. We have the awareness. Uh, and so I, I wonder if the role of the artist now is to um, lead by example. And um, uh, so I think of, I think of somebody like uh, Jason DeCaris Taylor, who um, does these underwater uh, concrete sculptures that actually help save the coral reef and uh, help create new uh, new life there. And then I think also just, um, I think the role of the artist in their more public facing kind of uh, persona is maybe, um, maybe similar to the role of the philosopher to get people to question their assumptions. Um, because I think uh, people have deeply embedded assumptions about the climate crisis. And um, until we can overcome some of those, uh, some people aren't going to move forward at all. And so I, I would say those are the main, two main kind of ideas I, I have for uh, what the role of the artist is for, for this at this moment anyway. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. How about you, Kendra? Um, yeah, thanks. I, I'm loving hearing these perspectives from Laura and Michael. Um, I know we have David Max here on the call and that Charmaine uh, shared the kind of three modes of engagement that David uses. And when I think about what the role of the artist is in the climate crisis, I think about these roles of uh, greening the sector, uh, of raising the um, profile and of reauthoring the world. And reauthoring the world from the first uh, framework that you showed was also called transformation, which is a word that comes up a lot in um, David's work and that I think about a lot. I really like these three modes in combination. I think they kind of make it for uh, eco restorative art. And Jason DeCares Taylor, who Michael just mentioned, is one of my favorite artists too, and I think one of the most skilled practitioners um, in the conceptual art uh, of, of that kind of work. So in the work where um, eco-restorative work, we're paying attention to that materiality as well. Uh, and that the work of kind of um, raising the profile, I mean, we all know how to recycle because so much attention was given to us in communications, teaching us how to do it. Like there is um, a useful place for um, that, I think, when when it's within when it's couched in an experience that's transformational um one example of a, a, a long piece that we're embarking on it's called when pigs fly and we're taking an acre of land that's pretty much been compacted and um, destroyed here close to where i live and um through a um, permaculture process that's paired with a theater process we're going to transform the land 
in a fossil free way, uh, taking 10 years to do it. So in the first uh, year, we'll have a, a sow that gives birth to maybe up to a dozen pigs and those pigs will help us clear um, some of the brush and tree stumps that are on the land as we guide the land um, towards being um, able to produce food as well as theater. We're in a very food insecure um, spot where I live. So uh, I, I think this idea of being uh, entangled with the non-human that Lara was talking about, like I'm super interested in interspecies work and in that relationship with the non-human. And as to what it means to make theater with a dozen pigs, it's a terrifying prospect, but like how great to do it and to do it in a community that can take from that work both like, hey, I didn't know pigs could help you clear land. I don't have to do it, you know, with heavy machinery, but also all of the joy and wonder and magic that we can put into a show with a title like When Pigs Fly. Yeah, that is really great. Thank you so much. Um, well, I think we'll move on to the next question and keep weaving back and forth uh, between all of our questions. I'm wondering what you think about whose voices are heard um, in art that that uh, confronts climate change, whose perspectives are reflected, and whose are excluded. So I think I'm hearing that the non-human world is is one voice, one perspective. Um, I'm just wondering if if you have further thoughts about that or or other perspectives. So maybe Michael, um, I think that you and I were talking before about the book Outsider Art uh, by Nicole Fleetwood. And I wondered if you might want to share a bit about that. Um, just to clarify, the book is called Marking Time. Oh, um, sorry. Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration, but it's about um, what a lot of people call outsider art. Uh, and there's, a, there's another famous book, I can't remember the author, that uh, collected all these artworks by people in an insane asylum, and I'm saying insane asylum because that's what the term was uh, in the early 1900s when he collected these works. Um, and so, outsider, uh, outsider art is is always is a continuous problem just with art in general. And uh, so, I think one of the problems with ta trying to tackle any kind of issue is there are already too many voices not being heard in the art world, and. Um, so, um, so basically, if the art world can't figure out how to elevate voices of people that might bring something new to the conversation, we're we're doing some of the same things over and over again, and it's not really um, it's, it's it's proven to not be terribly useful. And we keep privileging the people that are already privileged in the art world, and. Um, so I guess um, part of why I bring this up is, um, you know, to maybe as an analogy, um, sometimes, well, I don't know, sorry, I was going off in a different direction, but I'm not sure if it's, if it's useful or not. I guess I'll go with it and we'll see. Um, I remember hearing about um, these scientists um, that were studying some, some, there's something wrong with this land. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember the details, so I'm, I apologize for that. But there's something wrong, and they were trying to figure out a solution. And uh, these are the, you know, the well-educated scientists, the uh, at the elitist of the elite universities, and things like that. And uh, it took the farmers that were on the land every day to finally point them to a solution because they were because they were familiar with the land. And so I guess I feel a similar way with artists. It's it's a different context, of course, but. Um, Sometimes artists that are that are you know more experimental and trying new things and uh, and do and uh, not on uh, not in the uh, level where they have to you know maybe keep up. I don't want to sound too negative because I don't think it's completely that, but keep up appearances and keep doing the same things over and over again for the sake of their um, reputations and so on. Sometimes it takes uh, some of these artists that are uh, don't have that yet, where they're still in the experimental phase, to really point out some some really useful ways of of using art for social change, and uh, and it's been true. I mean, like even um, even uh, you know artists that 
you know, were out were quote outsider art at a particular time made big social impact. I'm thinking of. Um, I think they were, were they called the Gorilla Girls? Was that the, is that what I'm talking about? Okay, it was, okay, it was Gorilla Girls. Um, made huge impact on the art world um, at, at the time and probably still are necessary to keep going. But um, so some people do get through, but uh, for some reason with uh, certain social issues, we're, we're not really allowing, uh, <laughs> where the people that are controlling um, the scene aren't really allowing it to, to get through. And one of those examples is, um, art made by incarcerated persons, which uh, Nicole Fleetwood, I see the link in the chat there. It's uh, my, my quick plug of the book is in 2020, a lot of people that publish books, the books got lost with the, the, the terribleness of the year, but uh, Marking Time by Nicole Fleetwood is one of the greatest books. It set a new standard for anything written on art making in prison. And uh, she did a corresponding show of of art made by incarcerated persons at MoMA PS1 shortly the, as soon as as soon as it was possible um, pandemic wise but uh, I think they're currently in uh, Providence Rhode Island right now um, but anyway there I'll be quiet now <laughs> oh that's really helpful thank you so much um, I think you've hit on the point of of uh, who is deemed credible and who is val you know whose perspectives are valued whose types of knowledge and doing ways of doing things are, are valued uh, and so who is generally um, accepted and in what circles is is very important so yeah thank you Michael Kendra you were nodding at uh, Gorilla Girls uh, for those of us who might not know can you give a short summary of who they are and what they did no I no. can't <laughs> but I will talk to the question um uh, part of what the only animal done does is runs the artist brigade. The artist brigade's um, job is to bring arts and artists uh, to the heart of the climate movement. And what we find with the artist brigade currently, it's a, a collective of a hundred people. We we reached out wanting to spend a year um, with artists and take them on different um, processes to bring them to the work. And all of them were passionate, wildly passionate to do this work. And what we found is that climate grief and climate anxiety, fear that they won't be able to represent the science, right? Or these kinds of things are keeping people, um, artists from creating work about climate. And so how do we remove those barriers? Another, another thing we did when we, um, when we first sort of put out the call to gather this cohort is that we really prioritized a diversity of lived climate experience. Uh, and when we asked people about their lived climate experience, and then we understood that when you have that diversity, um, that it maps absolutely onto intersectional identities. Um, and so our artist brigade is uh, more than half, 50 to 75% of people who are not coming from a kind of middle-class white settler um, perspective. And so that really does bring a whole bunch of different kinds of issues and perspectives forward. I always think about it like if I was gonna lift something heavy, if I was moving house and I had a huge table, in order to help out, my buddies would all kind of have to find a place to grab on. And we don't need to be prescriptive to artists about what their place is to grab on. There's something in their story that intersects climate. And they just need to know that that they're needed there and supported through these processes of climate grief and working through anxiety in order to be mobilized. And of course, this same journey exists with all of the people we're trying to reach with citizenry, who in theater we also think of as our audience. Thanks, Kendra. Laura, how about you? Whose perspectives are, are valued? Whose are left out? Yeah, um, well, I'm fascinated to hear what Kendra's doing because I'm very excited by um, kind of animal animal performance as well. But I, I will also talk about Indigenous perspectives in Australia because this has been a huge component of our project so far is to kind of look at the ways in which, you know, Indigenous um, dance particularly, um, but also, you know, theatre or performance art um, is really not automatically not separating out ideas of care for country. It's already imbricated 
just by proxy. It doesn't have to be a work that's about um, kind of ecocide or environmental themes. It's already woven in because of a, of a kind of um, philosophies, for, of Indigenous philosophies that already take that into account. And, and that's something to learn from. And I wrote a few years ago about an amazing work um, that many of you um, will be familiar with, Marina Abramovich as the artist is present where, you know, she sat, of course, in MoMA across the room from invited all these people in, right, to sit with her and be present. And we had an, an Indigenous, um, she's actually a sculptor primarily, but made a performance art piece, uh, a woman called Robin Latham, um, uh, whose uh, who's country is, is kind of on the west coast of Australia, um, but who lives in Melbourne. And Robin Latham got permission from Abramovich and made a work called The Aborigine is Present and had a lot of different um, Indigenous performers sit down in Federation Square and invited in any members of the public, whoever was kind of around in this very central part of um, Melbourne city. And it wasn't a work that was explicitly a kind of about environmental themes, right? It was a work about being present, about acknowledging history and 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 recognizing um, uh, you know indigenous presence on the land still, even um, despite the kind of history of of genocide in this country. But it really was a work that drew attention to kind of ideas of extinction, right? This is a, a group of people, or many groups of people in Australia who've lived with the threat of extinction now since colonisation. And so it brings up a lot of the kind of similar themes and, and kind of useful thinking um, that, that kind of is useful for, for transposing then onto to other kinds of uh, works about thinking about being, living in the sixth max extinction as we do. So, and, you know, and it's also about how do we relate to one another? What is our responsibility to, to others as colonial subjects, as Indigenous subjects, as no, what is our relationship to the non-human? What is our relationship and our ethical responsibility as a nation towards our closest neighbours in the, in the Pacific Islands that are going underwater um, thanks to the kinds of um, global warming that that we've been far more, um, you know, responsible for inducing. And um, another uh, Indigenous artist or First Nations artist that I work on is Latai Tamopeo, who's a Tongan Australian um, born artist. And uh, Latai's work, I mean, is extraordinary and is really centred around the theme of, of climate change and particularly the impact of rising sea levels on her, her ancestral homelands in the Pacific Islands. Um, you know, but Latai's you know, voice is such an important kind of uh, unusual perspective um, to have in, in, um, in, the, in the mix really, um, because, you know, she shows, she makes works, for example, one very famous work she's doing a kind of tradition, traditional sort of dance um, in a perspex tank and the water level is rising and it becomes kind of harder and harder for her to kind of do her dance as she kind of slowly is submerged in the water. Um, as she made another performance piece uh, that was called Island Exile that was originally developed at a, a, a COP, which was, I don't know, it was maybe 2012. It was... Uh, quite an earlier, much earlier COP um, than the ones we kind of think about. Um, and our Prime Minister at the time, Kevin Rudd, who was a left-wing sort of Prime Minister, wasn't doing, you know, weren't making any real commitments to the Pacific Islands. Um, it was in Bali, I believe, that COP. And Latai was invited as an artist and a collaborator there. And, and she made this extraordinary work called Island Exile, where she hung herself suspended in ropes um, in a structure and there was a very large massive sort of piece of ice above her that slowly dripped onto her and kind of um, was sort of enacting a form of kind of water torture while while all these sort of politicians sat around twiddling their thumbs and umming and ahhing and not making any real kind of commitment to change or 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 really even laying out their kind of obligations so those are again quite confronting but I think really powerful work um, from voices that that do get excluded or have historically been very excluded I think we're, they're, we're more aware now um, of, about that ethics that we we kind of have to address towards our neighbors towards 
um, Indigenous Australians. But again, those intersections kind of rise to the fore. Yeah, thank you. We we have a colonial um, history of genocide here in Canada too, and the same kinds of uh, themes come up where uh, Indigenous worldviews are not um, part of the fabric of, of how governments work, uh, the Canadian governments work, and how we operate in terms of our relationship with the land, and also, like you say, responsibilities for, you know, my family's from Sri Lanka, a small island state, uh, similar we have similar concerns about sea level rise and uh, what happens there. Kendra or Michael, do you have any more thoughts and, and examples to add? Or maybe you'd like to expand more about uh, the work that you're doing and, and give more examples. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in um, uh, with a couple of Artists Brigade pieces that we commissioned this year. Um, one, uh, we went, we went through a process where we, um, took artists in groups of 25, uh, to places where they could experience the climate in crisis or to experience climate solutions. And then we asked them from those experiences to, um, to make pitches to us with arts-based engagement and our artist brigade, um, they're from every discipline, not just theater. And um, one animator, her name is Wen Wen Lu, um, and she is an immigrant um, from Hong Kong. She decided that she wanted to work with Chinese calligraphy. Uh, she's an animator. Um, and she wanted to work with um, the characters for forest, uh, family, and community uh, with her own experience that as an immigrant, even though uh, a kind of reverence for the natural world is part of her like the values um, that she brought from Hong Kong that she felt like she hadn't translated that into the place that she now lives. And she felt like there was a deficit of that in the community that she's part of. Anyway, so she made this beautiful um, little animation. It's on our website and I can throw that into the chat. They kind of looked at it and as we, um, we were receiving drafts of it, we were wondering if she would do subtitles for us so that we could understand in English more about what the characters were actually saying. And it was a really interesting negotiation about whether she wanted to talk to her own community or whether she wanted to talk to other communities as well. Uh, in the end, she did, it wasn't quite subtitles, it wasn't standard subtitles, but she opened some doors um, for those of us who, who don't read um, Chinese calligraphy to be able to understand the ideas she was working with. Um, so I don't know, I, I think that that was an idea as an artist that I would never have. Um, that she found and brought to us and had a community she wanted to speak to. And it it sort of seems to me like part of the, you know, the danger of us talking or me talking about the role of the artist in, in the climate crisis is that I only have my perspective. Um, uh, at, but, that, but that there's just, it's an, such an enormous issue, climate crisis, and that there's so, so many ways in um, for people. Anyway, I'll throw that into the chat. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. Exactly. There, we we can't all speak to everyone, um, and so what can we offer uh, to to make hopefully change in in specific people in in specific ways? And I do appreciate what's in the chat too. It it is. I am curious too about more. Um, you know, how can change be affected within the seats of power and uh, examples of where that's actually made an impact because, you know, Lara, as we know, I mean, of course, with COP, uh, all of these meetings, it's it's difficult to, to see what kind of changes can be made when we're here how many years later. Um, and that kind of performance art, you know, it should have, you would hope that it would have impacted people on a deep level to be able to make changes. But of course, I guess they're constrained by all kinds of things, who knows. But I'd love to hear more, um, Michael, if you want to jump in, but more about uh, art that's made an impact and or been able to unearth voices that we don't normally uh, hear from. Um, I would talk more about the uh, impact aspect, um, but from a slightly different context than, than what we normally think of as fine art. 
Uh, so one of the things I didn't mention is I'm currently co-editing a book um, on digital fashion. And um, if you know anything about the fashion industry, it's the second largest cause of pollution in the world. And so one of, uh, for, for at least two reasons, uh, I mean, two main reasons, there's lots of, there's probably lots of other reasons, but at least two main reasons. One is overproduction. Uh, they make way too much of things and then it goes in landfill. And then the other is um, uh, next time you return something online, just remember that they most likely don't resell it. They throw it in the trash. <laughs> so, uh, which seems like such a bad business plan, but I guess they account for it in everything. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm actually not sure the business strategy behind that move but this is this has been well documented the, that more often than not so the reason why i'm bringing this up is i think artistic practices can change in certain ways so one of the things about fashion is learn designers that can uh fashion is something that's sort of thrust onto us um they don't do test groups like they might do with a new um tv show uh where they have a bunch of people watch it and the people say oh we all hate it so they don't make it or they love it and they make it. They don't, they don't like, like big fashion companies don't say, Hey, do you like this shirt? <laughs> they just say, here's the shirt. It's in the store. Um, and uh, so now would be a way for them to design online, get some feedback because uh, digital rendering programs have gotten so much better than they might have been even five years ago. Uh, and digital fashion saw a huge rise during the pandemic uh, during the early days of the pandemic in particular. And um, with all this, with all the talk that everyone's, uh, you know, uh, already hearing every, you know, it's become a daily thing now to hear something about the metaverse and these things. There's a lot of things um, that are very beneficial for these new technologies. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm just for full disclosure, I'm not a complete advocate on any of these things, but I do see ways in which it can be useful. So um, one way might be, um, uh, a lot of commercials that people make, for example, are designed where they, put, they get these elaborate sets. And now they can do a lot of that digitally with maybe a small team um, and not just make this set and then tear it down and throw it out. Or, I mean, hopefully they reuse some of that stuff anyway. But uh, so I think there's, uh, for theater, I'm wondering if there's a way to incorporate um, digital backdrops um, for, for theater. Uh, they actually created a, a space for, I can't remember, I want to say it might have been Disney, but they created a 3D room or like a well, room that was just uh, surrounded the actors and they were able to project a 3D non-existent world onto the walls in a sense where, uh, I, I'm probably not explaining the technology very well. but It sounds like the holodeck from Star Trek. Yeah, it's, yeah, similar to that, like where they, where they, actually created the entire set just digitally and so it didn't create any waste at all um now i will say that's actually slightly slightly uh, misunderstanding i mean um i i recently uh recognized that uh or recently been um shown an article that uh every single one of us has an email probably if i if we're if if we were to really think about it each of us has more than one email and in each of our email inboxes or archive or whatever are probably hundreds of emails we don't need. And that still does create digital waste that leads to an, an, have an environmental impact. So I don't want to say that digital things are the complete solution. Uh, they still have it. It's, it's far less than physical things. Um, but uh, I do wonder if in this instance, there's a way to borrow from, I mean, we, we're, we're probably never gonna get away from physical sculptures and physical paintings. And in the same way that we won't get away from physical clothing, it's not like we're just gonna see each other digitally only, uh, but there is a, that's what most of the, the big digital fashion people are calling for, like the companies, is a way to, a way to pair this with your physical uh, aspect. Because a lot of people, for example, especially, um, studies have shown that uh, Gen Z buys a garment and wears it seven times before it goes in the trash. Um, and a lot of people buy things just for that one Instagram photo. So in the same way that if we could translate some of that stuff where it's only going to live online to a digital only component in fashion, why couldn't we do some of the same things with art? And, and that, that would be one example. I know that was a long way to get there, but um, 
but uh, I think it's it's headed that way in a in a really I think digital fashion. Oh, and the other thing I was going to say about voices, the great thing about digital fashion is I. I know that someone that's really immersed in physical fashion in that world knows a lot, a lot of fashion people and, and so on. Um, but with digital fashion, and maybe it's partly because it's still the early days of it, and that's, that is a factor, it's so much more decentralized. And you can talk directly with designers. Um, like You're not going to get a conversation with um, uh, Tommy Hilfiger probably, but you can talk directly to a lot of the digital fashion designers and it's raising people uh, up that whose voices would not be heard as much. Uh, you know, I, I never would have heard about um, some clothing designers for physical clothing in, uh, in uh, other parts of the world other than the US and, and Europe. And um, I have connections probably in like every continent just about, maybe not Antarctica, but <laughs> but every every continent with digital fashion at this point. And um, so it's really interesting to see how that, uh, and I think that's a good example of how the digital uh, aspect of things can really um, level the playing field as well. Yeah, that's a great example too. It's democratizing fashion for those who have the, the technical, you know, savvy and the, and the, bandwidth and the uh, computer technology. Yeah, that's a really great example. And I see in the chat too, I was thinking of opera because my husband loves the ring cycle. And, and I remember watching uh, a, a performance where it was a digital background on these, maybe some of you have seen it. It's just very cool by the Met, um, but it was all digital on these, these things that could move and and it was just very interesting I've, I've never seen anything like it before um Kendra you're in the theater space or Laura if you want to jump in but I I thought I'd open the floor well I thought I would just jump in about very large theaters um because I think there are options there are creative options with materiality that aren't um carbon intensive uh one of the projects we're working on right now is called a thousand year theater um, it's a planted set uh, out of our native species here uh, in BC that will come to its maturation in a thousand years time. Um, the piece is, um, we have two sort of possible sites for it. One, a clear cut on the mountain where I live and one, a reclaimed industrial land uh, in Vancouver. Um, and of course the, the growing of a forest isn't what a tree company that replants for um, a timber plantation is doing. It's a much more delicate process. And then how you invite um, uh, the, a, a human stewardship of that because our native species of course are slowly migrating and trees walk very slowly indeed away as things are getting warmer. So how can we as humans step in and help our native um, red cedar um, biome do well here in, in, the, in this land? And so I think that it's also um, a sort of um, radical act of belief in the future to commit to something for a thousand years. It invites us to work with the future and invites our audience to think about, because we'll do a show every year for a thousand years in the cycle. And you might think, oh, I live in this place in our community. And in 300 years, maybe someone else who lives in this place will go to that theater. And what does it mean to be here now as a steward for that future? And so as much as it is, um, a site and doing a sort of physical reclaiming of, of land in the natural ecosystem and a collaboration with animals and trees and water and all of these things. It's also really a thought experiment, um, a, a way to sort of orient oneself um, for transformation and the transformations to come. Yeah, that's a fascinating example. It will be so amazing to see. Laura? Michael? Um, that's so great. And I think, you know, I put in the chat that it's that that long term futuristic thinking is also, you know, such an anti capitalist, you know, it's a degrowth <laughs> gesture because of its temporality. And that's so important right now. We need to push back against against kind of our kind of current ideas of growth if, if we're really going to survive this emergency, I believe. Um, but I wanted to pick, go back and pick up on a point that Kendra, both Kendra and Michael 
both made really about who you want your artwork to speak to. And, uh, and I think this is a really interesting, you know, we're talking about artists as well, but, um, you know, Michael's also talking about audiences or in thinking about, well, who who gets that that prison poetry or, you know, who who is actually receiving um, this and are they, are, and it comes back to that kind of political theatre question, are we just kind of preaching to the converted anyway um, by, you know, making sort of, black box theater or even site specific theater you know who who is who is going to this stuff who is encountering it and there's a really another interesting example in australia um you know one of the audiences that we don't kind of think about a huge amount is um you know mining in our you know we're a, a country where our wealth is based on extraction based on mining um of all our you know ancient and um precious, precious underground materials. Uh, and uh, there's a particular artist um, that I work with named Hartmut Veit, who um, worked or made a, a kind of, mul went over several years, a piece of sort of art and performance art in um, a community called Morwell, which is a regional part of Victoria, the state where I live. And um, Hartmut was living in this community at the time of uh, the Morwell uh, bush, uh, the Morwell fires, where um, an open cut mine, our dirtiest um, brown coal um, uh, um, mine, caught fire um, during during the summer. Um, you know, for various reasons, and they couldn't put it out. It burned for forty days, and it caused the worst air pollution event to date uh, uh, in the country at, at the time. And um, Hartmut set up in response to this, these galleries, he took over, this was already a town that really struggled socioeconomically. A lot of people, you know, who lived in the town worked in the mine at the Hazelwood power station. That was their, that was their livelihood. It was their, their generational um, narrative as well. You know, they, they, they'd grown up um, where their, you know, parents had worked there. So um, and suddenly it was looking like the whole thing was going to kind of come to an end. Um, people were scared, people were extremely sick, um, and people were suffering um, kind of all sorts of uh, kind of mental sort of uh, responses as well. Probably, you know, they were suffering mentally um, from, from all of the stress and the, the disorientation of what was going on. So Hartmut um, set up these gallery spaces in the abandoned shops uh, fronts, and invited people in. There was coal dust just everywhere. That was just life in that town. Um, and they, it was everywhere. And he invited, he collected it all up, swept the streets um, in a kind of performance mode of kind of care and um, cleaning and, um, and collected all this coal dust and invited people from the community to come in um, and kind of created these sort of uh, they're kind of like Rorschach images in a way on the floors, really beautiful by just playing with the coal dust. There were kids like making snow angels in the coal, in the coal dust, putting their roller skates through it. And then he'd kind of make these particular artworks that were visual artworks that he would sort of spray down and, and keep with the coal dust. Um, but because he did this over a series of years and he was kind of attacked at various points and things, um, verbally abused and things like that because people thought he was a bit of a weirdo and what was he doing? What was he doing in this this town where you know people knew other people and what was he against the the mine or for the mine? Um, you know, people were ambiguous as to his position, but I think he gave a really beautiful example of thinking about audiences um, that we don't normally reach. And when it became this crisis point, they brought in the emergency services um, or the Victorian government brought in the, these trauma experts to try and deal with what people had been going through. And nobody wanted to use these um, these services, basically. They didn't trust, the local people didn't trust them. They weren't interested. Um, and it, they felt betrayed anyway by the government not kind of evacuating them in time and things like that. People had lost their pets, their livestock, you know, all sorts of things. So, um, yeah, but he set up also these uh, these gallery spaces, invited people in, 
And um, people really wanted to talk to him because by that stage, they knew kind of who he was. They got a trauma expert. They ended up funding him to have a trauma expert to sit there with um, him. And he would sketch people with charcoal um, while they sat there and talk to them about their experiences. Um, and it was a really, yeah, a beautiful example of kind of, you know, we talk about outsider art, but also you know, outsider audiences, people that are not necessarily the the, like, the usual suspects in the galleries, um, but needing a, a space for kind of, I guess it was a sort of arts therapy um, with people that they trusted or were willing at least to take a chance on and, and kind of have a dialogue with. So I just wanted to put that out there too. Yeah, that's a really great example. So it's it also makes me think of uh, not just art being received by people, but engaging people in different ways and people co-creating the art or being part of part of the processes right um I yeah. think that's a really great example um and thank you for for people who've been putting in the chats um different resources and and uh Chantal you put in something about uh why preaching to the choir is a useful and necessary thing I think that'll give us all uh, a relief a uh, feeling of relief <laughs> for those of us who wonder if we're doing anything useful. Um, I thought I'd ask Kendra while we're talking about uh, engaging people in art for, for I think, the art therapy and um, and talking about experiences and, and highlighting lived experiences is, is so valued. I want to um, shift back to using art for education and um, you know preparedness and and inviting communities to to be part of something that'll um, help them in an engaging way so Kendra you have a great example that I'm super excited about in, in my work yeah um, this is a project called catastrophe um, it's a human scale board game um, that is intended to go to science centers and it helps um, you and your family or your friend group um, go through a series of 16 uh, natural disasters, some climate caused, uh, extreme weather, that kind of thing. And, um, it, but it has this sort of playful cartoon setup that you have this cat that you named mm -hmm. Catastrophe and everywhere it goes, it creates disasters. So it's this like little blue cat, you're following it around, you're trying to learn how to survive. It's, a, it's based on the idea that embodied experience is what sticks. So that if you um, have the experience of being in a room and there's a fire and you're crawling under the smoke and you um, touch the door handle and it's warm so you don't go into the hall, that these are the kinds of um, embodied experiences that will stick if you're ever in that um, environment so that you don't just run to the window and then pass out from smoke inhalation. It's a project that we developed with Vancouver Emergency Management Association, part of the city of Vancouver, um, over about five years. And it was just meant to go to production when the pandemic hit and basically killed our science center, science world. So it's really on the shelves right now. But it was something that we developed um, along with um, fire and police and rescue and um, all kinds of different uh, people who deal with resilience in our city. And the idea um, behind it was super practical that we know in a major disaster here in a situation like an earthquake, it's likely that you'll be on your own for a couple of days. And so how, how do we give um, everyday people um, an engagement opportunity? Because when people learn about this kind of emergency preparedness, what the experts find is that they, they're just too scared to deal with it. Again, a different sort of um, anxiety gets in the way and prevents people from learning the things that they, their family, their friends might need to survive. And so, by packaging it in this like super gadget cartoon um, way, we think that there's a, a way to make it sort of um, fun and memorable. Um, at the very end, you find out that the cat has had kittens and you collect all the kittens and on the back of each of the cards, there's more information like reminders or what to go put in a go bag or think, you know, really practical stuff like that. So we're always kind of thinking like, how can we take what we do with fun and humor and delight and magic and bring it into these spaces where the hard conversations um, aren't happening in our busy lives. And like you say, I think it can be so overwhelming um, and there's so much, so much coming at you. Um, so 
how to make things, like you say, those embodied experiences um, matter really, I think, um, is very, very interesting and, and speaks to one of those frames of art as, um, you know, science communications and, uh, and, and for also, I just, I think it's so practical as well. Like we were saying, I have a, a Canadian Red Cross bag here because this is one of our giveaways at this conference I'm at. But I mean, until I received one of these things from the Canadian Red Cross, who's one of my partners at the University of Waterloo, I didn't quite think about the 72 hours um, that we might be alone and what actually I would need. This bag is pretty heavy. <laughs> Um, you know, my mom uh, lives around here and is afraid of earthquakes and her earthquake preparedness, sorry, mom, is uh, is a bunch of cans of things and uh, dish soap in the basement. So that's, I think, not also helpful, but it's what, what people might uh, go to when, when they don't know what else to do. So thank you, Kendra. Um, there's a really great uh, example in the chat, yes, refuge in Melbourne. Does anybody want to unmute and uh, talk about that at all? Refuge is becoming a new program called Center for Reworlding. Oh, thanks, Katya. Relaunching soon. That would be really interesting. Does anyone want to to speak about that program at all, or should we? We can just all look it up after the fact if no one wants to say anything I, I can just say quickly that oh sorry no Katya says she's gonna hi I'm so sorry I was a bit late to join um I can speak to uh some work that we did with uh the folks from refuge in Melbourne a couple of years ago so um one of the lead artists and then also someone from resilient Melbourne uh came to Vancouver to actually walk us through their um uh, their creative lab on resilience. So effectively, they bring a bunch of artists together and a bunch of emergency managers and scientists, and they get into a room and they all exchange knowledge on these really complex topics. And the lens that they've used for refuge is around the climate emergency. Um, but they focus uh, this work um, on a particular type uh, or impact of climate change every year. And I think one year it was heat, one year it was flood, one year it was pandemic, and their work on that was fascinating and very predictive for us. Um, and uh, and then the artists actually go away and they create um, what they call a disaster rehearsal on the topic. Um, so we went through a very condensed version of that process in Vancouver and Kendra, hi Kendra, was one of the incredible artists who participated in that um, as well when we did it in Vancouver. Thanks Katya, that's wonderful. Um, so I think uh, you know you're free panelists to to jump in if if there's anything else that you want to say before we move on to our our last question, which is the what is needed now uh, call for uh, call to action for artists and the arts community. So before I move on to that, any final thoughts about the last uh, section about impactful artwork, uh, who's engaged and how? Um, does anyone from the audience want to raise a question or, or speak up? Please do um, just unmute yourself. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, I just have one thing to say about that as far as impactful. Um, I think sometimes we kind of have talked to uh, different ways of kind of framing this, like, uh, but sometimes, um, like, I love what, uh, um, now I can't remember the phrase, uh, the, uh, the um, the audience that uh, that Laura mentioned um, preaching to the, the choir? outsider outsider, oh, outsider audience that's the word I, I couldn't think of the first word um, I love that because it's getting to the people I mean not everyone goes to art galleries unfortunately I don't I don't understand why but but uh, they don't and so I, get, I think getting getting something to people um, but also not I think preaching at people always puts them on a defensive and so I think. Artists that can do um, a, one of my well, one of my favorite philosophers uh, from you know my teenage years uh, was Soren Kierkegaard, and he um, he developed something that he calls indirect communication, where instead of um, pointing the finger at you, <laughs> um, it's similar to the Socratic method. Instead of pointing the finger at you, he would sort of get you to realize that you're in the wrong about something, and I think this is a 
perfect way for art to do that, especially, uh, I'm not sure how it would work necessarily for something static like a painting. I mean, maybe it could, I'm, I'm just not sophisticated enough to think of how that would work. But I think with um, theater or literature, there are definitely ways where you can present different perspectives of things in meaningful ways. Um, I mean, Dostoevsky was a master of it. He had a whole conversation in the Brothers Karamazov where he shows that the arguments for God and against God are both like bad. <laughs> and, he, and he does it in oh, this dialogue that's so amazing. And and I think there are people that could do something like that now. And I don't know, I mean, so the question is how, how do their voices get heard, of course, is, is still, uh, you know, a potential problem, but but I would say um, uh, artists nudging people and 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 challenging their assumptions rather than pushing them. Um, there's a time to be to be pushy, I think. So I, I you know I'm not saying there maybe maybe both are needed, but um, but uh, uh, maybe when you come to the gallery, you have you can expect to be pushed, but when the art comes to you, you can expect to be nudged. Maybe maybe that's the maybe that. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but maybe that's the maybe that's a good distinction. Yeah, it's it, it's a big question, right? What um, what will people actually take in, um, and you know, uh, what what even is what does impact even mean for different people, and what do we actually want to do? It's yeah, I but I agree with you, Michael. People don't want to be uh, shamed into something. I don't know how much shame does work. Yeah, well, and even um, even an example I heard of from a marine scientist in studies that he was doing, um, the sticking point, I don't know if this has changed, this is a little bit dated at this point, um, no more than 10 years, I would say, but um, but the sticking point for almost everybody that had a didn't really believe in climate change or something was, was that it's human caused. That was the sticking point. He said, "Well, okay, we can just skip that. Who cares? Who cares if 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 you accept that that there's a problem? Let's figure out how to solve it. Let's skip how we got here. You know, I mean, obviously, in a sense, it matters how we got here because we're 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 still doing some of the same things that we were doing. But uh, but that was an interesting thing. Like I that you without talking to people in a just a dialogue, you would never uncover that." That that's that that's the big hangup, or I mean, and like I said, I don't know if that still is, or if that's still considered the big hangup. But in the research that they did um, around ten or so years ago, that was the that was the sticking point for people. Um, and I also, uh, sorry, one more one more quick thing though, I also think like getting this giant thing. I know, like for people that are you know in the choir, so to speak, it is a giant thing. But I think sometimes small victories are just as important to start turning the tide. Um, and I think not underestimating um, small things in in what art is presenting instead of just saying, ah, climate change bad, <laughs> we need to do something. Uh, maybe there's smaller steps that some artists can take and demonstrate that help, you know, you know, start the, the turn, so to speak. Thank you. Um, anything else, Kendra or Lara, before we, we go on? Um, I, I think uh, maybe there's a point to be made also about audience engaged work where audiences are having experiences and not just receiving work passively that if we're looking and aiming for transformation to give someone an embodied experience of what it is to be in a different kind of relationship with the natural world, for example, or um, if we can do that part, you know, uh, in the three modes that David Max talks about in his work, he talks about reauthoring the world and this this role of um, artists as visionaries. What does world look like on the other side of a transformation in in that fossil free future? Because I often work with um, the other people in society who are telling the climate stories with scientists or with environmental activists, and they are really keen for um, the arts the artist to come in in that kind of imagination and visioning work because it's not really their wheelhouse and it is our wheelhouse and I think the most common question I get from the artists in the artist brigade or people who want to join the artist brigade is what can I do how can I be useful and as much as we can talk about well there's you know this incredible diversity of ways and how do you want to help I think that there's some like basic things that artists don't always know 
for example, artists really often want to work and do something about plastic bag recycling. And as much as I honor that there's work to be done in our relationship, like I feel like we're, we don't want to get involved with washing out our plastic bags on the Titanic. Yes, that's an everyday thing that is really concerning, but what other, um, what other deeper, how can you dig into that and get beyond the sort of behavioral wash out your plastic bags? And some of my thinking on that is really informed by um, uh, Vanessa Timmers, who uh, runs One Earth Society, which works on sustainable living. And something that she taught me is that behavior change is incredibly unstable. You might really work on me in a piece and I'm not going to, uh, I'm gonna bike to work every day, but then I can kind of trade that off because I'm gonna fly my family to Europe, uh, you know, every spring. And that kind of, that's a way in which behavior change is incredibly unstable, but that deeper work, that kind of reauthoring the world, that kind of transformation work works on the level of identity and core value. And that Vanessa Timmer says is so much more stable and from our core identity and our value, then all kinds of behaviors can spring. So this is this part of like working with artists about the question of what can you do that I think about so much, which is about um, how can you get be, be past the behavior level, the don't do this and do do this, and, um, and how can you get to that deeper level of who you are in relationship with the planet, who you, um, what you care about, and, and sort of work on that level of transformation and trust that a whole bunch of issues will shift once that transformation is done. Yeah, I think that really speaks to, Laura, what you were talking about before and your work. Yeah, I, lo I love all of that, Kendra. That's so interesting. And I, I want to pick up on two points. One is that, you know, we're going to have to give up a lot of things. Our lives are all going to change no matter what. And I think that those of us who live in the luxury are most scared of of giving that, you know, relinquishing particular things about the ways that we live. And I'm definitely not immune to that. But if we're really going to draw down, if we're really going to slow capitalism, or, um, you know, we, we are going to have to give up things. And, you know, I think that art is a space where you don't have to have stuff or you don't have to have money or you don't have to, you know, it can bring joy and fun. And it's a place where people can see that life can be rich and fulfilling and fun and magical and joyful with, with having less and, ha and having things a little bit more sim simple, I suppose, um, but maybe enriched in other in other ways. Um, and I, we're so deep in the capitalist narrative. I just don't, I think that's so hard for us to see that, or at least those of us in, in the kind of privileged West. Um, and so, yeah, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing about the plastic bags and the sort of those micro adjustments that you make to your life, you know, I agree that there, I, I think that there is a really strong relationship, though, to those small actions that you do and that you commit to. And, you know, they're not going to stop global warming or slow global warming or stop the plastics, you know, the fish choking on the plastics in the ocean. But they do represent a kind of mode of what you stand for. And therefore, and, and the more you integrate more of those things into your life, the less willing I think we'll become to let other like to put up with other people doing more egregious kinds of acts of 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 environmental harm. So I think it kind of it kind of situates you through the particular into that that global what we are willing and and not willing to accept. Yeah, that all uh, think globally, act locally. Um, yeah. Added, right. Uh, but I mean, I I I hear both points because uh, uh, I think going back to the idea of how do you actually affect change at the structural level and at the systemic level so at COP 27 at you know the the decision making table um, I just wonder if we have more examples of, of that kind of thing if behavior yes behavior is an indication of of how we would think in our um, in our lives and in other aspects of our professional world, but I, I see Kendra's point too, that it can be unstable. So I wonder about the deeper work and Lara, you were 
talking about this before and really, I think, centering Indigenous worldviews and values and what would that look like if in our society in an anti-capitalist world. Um, and maybe scenario building too is something that I know in, in my world, uh, we, we want artists to be engaged in the imagining of what could be so people know what to work towards and um, scenarios of if we do this, then this is the outcome. If we do that, this might be the outcome. And that again speaks to the performance um, uh, art that you spoke about at the beginning, Laura, where people need to see and, and experience the different realities to be able to make choices. So I think this is a really good lead into, you know, Kendra, you already um, uh, talked about this, but a call to, to action. So the what next, uh, what are the things that you want people to leave with in terms of um, how can artists and the arts play a big role in uh, the climate conversation and in tackling the climate crisis and continue to do so for those who have already been engaged. Maybe I'll speak, maybe uh, if nobody wants to jump in. Michael, what do you think? Uh, one thing that actually comes to mind um, is uh, part, part of the push to save certain areas or certain animals, for instance, are because they're cute or it's beautiful. Um, like you'll never see a campaign, you know, with people with signs saying "Save the slugs" or something. Um, I mean, maybe maybe somewhere you will, but generally speaking, you you people care about things that are already attractive. So I wonder if one role of artists is highlighting the uh, the beauty of some of the spaces that we don't often think of as our examples of beauty when. Uh, and, I, and part of the reason why I say this is um, I was thinking of like the Hudson River painters helped uh, show this wilderness of the U.S. Um, in, you know, in uh, like I guess the was it 1800s or so, and um, and it helped shape more than just like I look at those paintings and I didn't know what was what what influence they had at the time. I just think, oh wow, they're great landscapes, you know, and seeing them in person is amazing. Um, some of the some of them are uh, like Albert Bierstadt and people like that are some of my favorite painters. Um, but uh, they also um, very tellingly, um, I don't know if they had completely evil intentions as the artists or not, but they they didn't have um, indigenous people in their paintings. Um, they didn't have any people, so it's not like they it was you know. But they left people out of it, even though we know now that there were people in those in those areas. Now you could say the artists themselves did it for artistic reasons, and we could maybe give them a pass, perhaps. Uh, but it was used to exploit the land and remove people from it. Um, so whether that was the intention of the artist or not, I don't know. But uh, so that's that'd be one way. Um, and then the only other thing I was going to say is I think one of the most interesting things is collaborations with artists and scientists and philosophers. And we live in, you know, anyone that knows the structure of academia right now, and I'm like sort of, I've got like a toe in academia, that's about it. But, um, but anyone that knows, knows that it's so splintered. So, you know, I'm a philosopher, but I'm not just a philosopher that studies philosophy, I'm a philosopher that studies aesthetics. Um, so meaning like, I, I, I'm not supposed to know anything really about metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, or any of these other philosophical topics. I mean, like, other than just broad strokes. Um, and, uh, you know, so what I think we need is collaboration because, uh, scientists, you know, are great, but sometimes you need someone that has a creative way of looking at things and is just going to throw out, like maybe on the surface, an idea that seems out of left field almost, but it could be, you know, sometimes we need out of the box thinking for, big things. Um, and so I just think uh, collaboration. And uh, then the one last small thing is, uh, I think so, I think someone sort of alluded to this idea, but um, there's a theory of uh, uh, in political philosophy called deliberative democracy, which I don't necessarily hold to that as a theory of, de uh, of political, you know, philosophy, but uh, having looked at it enough, um, deliberation practices are actually very useful. And I, I think 
art galleries and shows and other and other kinds of theater could be a really great way. I I see a lot of talks, um, and even occasionally some panel discussions, but I don't see some really good dialogue that is like more, uh, uh, for lack of better words, curated dialogue at art museums and galleries. And I think that is something missing. And what they've shown from deliberation is people may not change their minds, but what, they, what they've shown when they do tests, when they do like these really formal processes, they show that the knowledge they had when they, uh, when they left is greater than the knowledge they had when they, when they went in. And I think that's one of the bigger uh, takeaways so that, that would be very important for, for, these, for, for all of the big issues. But, um, but since we're talking about climate change, um, I think there's a lot of facts people just don't know. And because uh, they're, 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 they're only hearing, uh, like a lot of people haven't done any real research on it. So hearing, you know, some having things presented in a way um, I think would be useful. So uh, that'll be it for me. Thanks, Michael. And when we say scientists, let's not forget the social scientists. I feel like in the science hierarchy, we are uh, <laughs> lower down on the, on the pole and people uh, sometimes can discount us. So just advocating for us. Yeah. <laughs> I can I can maybe jump in there, Charmeline, just sure. to say that um, I, I would love to see our sector uh, embrace that, you know, as much as you might traditionally in your budgets have a lighting designer or a venue rental line, that we need lines um, for scientists or other people who can act as uh, climate dramaturgs. They should be in every project for environmental organizations to be a part of every project, indigenous knowledge holders to be part of every project. And I think when we start building creative teams like that, we're really enriching and connecting ourselves um, to, to sectors who really are looking for us and need us. Uh, in a conversation I had about five years ago with a major environmental organization in Canada, David Suzuki Foundation, they said to me, Kendra, we're a science-based organization and we know that the fact-based approach is dead. We cannot reach people anymore with um, information about dying bee colonies or um, endangered orca. We need artists. We need artists in every press release. We need artists in every project. We need artists in every creative team. We've, we need art and artists in everything that we're doing. It's our only way forward. And I know that they are having trouble finding us and that we are the communicators. Um, so let's empower ourselves to go find those other people uh, who are telling the climate story and combine forces um, to do that kind of thing. I really like Michael's call for out of the box thinking. And I think when we hold very dear to us our ethics, so The Only Animal is a buy nothing new company, we're a no fly company, um, we're a fossil free creation company, and we get all kinds of ideas that don't match those ethics, and those are not the projects we do. And so we use our special artist superpowers of an, uh, imagination and outrageous thinking and aud audaciousness, but we hold ourselves to um, a, a sort of ethical framework. And I think that artists are totally used to creating within boundaries. We all have budget boundaries and we've grown up creating in all kinds of boundaries. So how can we hold to our climate boundaries and create within them? Um, because I think the very act of doing that is creating um, right relations in, in these climate times. Lovely. Thank you, Kendra. Could I, Laura, could I get Kendra to repeat the, the three things that they are no to, no fly? What was the other, the other two? We're a buy nothing new company, a no fly company, oh, and uh, we're a fossil free production company. And I'll post a link to our core values um, that we hold to um, in, in the chat. Okay, thank you. Um, and Laura, I'll give you the to... phone. Yes, go ahead, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, Shamali. Um, I thought I'd pick up on um, uh, Michael's point about deliberative um, sort of thinking and the power of that, I guess. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say that the artist I described before who lived in Morwell in the in the mining community, um, what he's spent the last uh, seven years doing is building a, a meditation and art space in the suburbs of Melbourne. Um, and I've been to this space. So they run um, kind of the gal they run like teaching you how to paint workshops. Um, they run regular yoga and meditation. 
uh, and they also stage um, performances uh, in the space as well. And he kind of lives in the space as well. Um, but it's that, again, it's that holistic approach to thinking about, and it comes back to what Kendra's doing as well, about with pace and timing and that slowing things down, um, not working at the kind of speed of capitalism, of, of thinking kind of expansively and, and in a long-term way, but also leaving that space for deliberation for coming to terms with the grief and the fear that we're feeling, um, but also it, it sort of combining that then with creative practice and imagination and fun and community, and again doing it in a in a suburb where which is not a kind of um, elite inner city suburb. It's it's just a kind of more regular regular place and and offering those people um, you know the opportunity to do to kind of open their minds and, and deliberate and and have and, and slow down and 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 have that kind of expansion in in new in new ways it's called stanley avenue studio if anyone's interested thank you so much laura well we're um uh, at the tail end of, of such a great talk thank you so much to all of you for sharing and for all of you who who stayed with us um i'm going to uh turn things over to judy from scale thank you so much for putting um, uh, the information about scale in the chat, but I, I'd like to give you the opportunity to speak because I think all of what we've talked about needs so much more. Um, we need to continue the conversation. And uh, as Kendra was saying, we people are searching for artists and artists, you welcome to search for us academics. And we'd love to work together on, on all the various things that, need to be done in this climate crisis. So Judy, I'll just um, give you the floor if you'd like to unmute and please uh, just say a few words about scale and, and how people can get involved. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure. Um, I've been listening to all of you. Um, my name is Judy Pearl. I use she, her pronouns and I'm coming today from unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory, um, colonially known as Ottawa. Um, <clears throat> some of the people here, I think, are already members of SCALE, but for those who aren't, I just wanted to encourage you to please come and join us. SCALE, it's, it's an acronym. It stands for Sectoral Climate Arts Leadership for the Emergency. And <clears throat> what it uh, was, David, as I said, um, David Maggs, Kendra Fanconi, and a number of others co-founded this organization. Uh, we're less than a year old since our incorporation. Uh, conversations go back a little bit further than that. But really what it is is a uh, collaborative space. We are building a network of networks to gather together all of the initiatives and projects and programs and organizations that are working at this intersection of climate and culture in Canada. Um, and as we grow, we will certainly continue to, to branch out internationally. Right now, we're really focused on building the network within so-called Canada, um, but also happy to make international connections. So it is honoring and respecting all the wonderful people who are doing this great work together and, and or, sorry, I should say, who are doing this great work already and building a space for them to come together, to collaborate, to meet each other, to network, to advocate. Um, and to share best practices and really ultimately to build the leadership capacity of the sector in the climate emergency. We work with the, the three modes of engagement framework quite a bit. Um, you'll see that on our website, the greeting the sector, raising the profile and reauthoring the world. And we really try to um, offer activities and, and opportunities to learn and collaborate around all of those modes of engagement. So um, the... Um, the URL is in the chat there. Um, you can join our mailing list there. Uh, and one of the key features of SCALE is uh, what we call the round table, which is um, really just a growing group of, of people who are really engaged, artists and arts organizations who are really engaged in this work, who want to meet each other, who want to collaborate, continue to learn from each other, find solutions together, collaborate, especially across disciplines, across regions, across cultures. So that's that's what scale is. Uh, we are also a bilingual organization, and um, I hope to see you all there. Thank you so much, Judy. That's wonderful. What a great um, what a great organization to turn to next. Because sometimes you you leave one of these talks and thinks and think to yourself, okay, now what do I do? So check out scale <laughs> and join. Um, I just want to thank uh, again all of our panelists. 
for sharing today uh, to Mass Culture and Scale for organizing and sponsoring, um, and to the Cultural Research Network, uh, people who have joined us for the virtual study group today. We really appreciate it. So um, all the best, and thank you again to everyone.